This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. My grandfather was a Navy man, who, like me, followed geopolitics closely, and we worked all around the world. And although I never got the chance to have the discussion with him, I'm sure there would be many political situations around the world that we could discuss today, and that we would likely agree upon. But one that I think that we'd be diametrically opposed to would be our feelings towards the nation of Japan. In his time, the Japanese were the whipmasters of a vast Pacific Empire that stretched all the way from the borders of Russia as far east, all the way down to the islands just outside of Australia's waters north of Papua New Guinea. He had lived through the Second World War and the titanic struggle between this eastern giant and a combined western force. I have no idea what he might say if I were to tell him Tokyo is one of our staunchest allies, a partner in the region, and a key to our strategy to counterweight a growing China, who to remind you in his time was a close American ally. I bring this up because it needs to be stressed at just how much has changed in this theater over the last 70 years. Just in that time, Japan has been devastated by the war, had centuries of expansion gobbled up by the UK, the US and the Russians, and had most of its industries decimated. But Japan being the industrious nation that they are, not only rebuilt their nation, but are once again a regional power. Not through military conquest this time, but through economic prowess. The Japanese today are the world's third largest economy, dwarfing many of their former enemies in the UK, Australia and France. The only two nations above them in GDP will be their new partners in the United States and the growing mainland masters of East Asia, the People's Republic of China. It would feel like a full 180 on the situation if I was to have this conversation with my late grandfather 75 years ago. But as we talked about in previous episodes, things like this can change. Politics is fluid, but the fundamentals of geography stay the same. And although Japan is blessed with beautiful mountains and rich harbors, Japan lacks most of the resources critical for an expansion of a nation. It is a key handicap that in the past has forced them to expand into areas like Korea and Manchuria and the Dutch East Indies to feed the Japanese machine. But with conquest and war no longer on the cards for the Sunrise Kingdom, how is Japan looking to secure their nation's critical needs? Well, to talk about all of that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. The Return from Armageddon Japan is a fundamentally insecure country in a dangerous neighborhood. To get to the root of Japanese geopolitics, you've really got to understand their geography. It just doesn't have the food or the natural resources that it needs to sustain its population or its economy. Its landscape is dominated by mountains and forests, which mean that only around a third of the country is actually suitable for large scale settlement or farming. That's why if you look at a population map of Japan, you'll see that pretty much all of the major cities are in the small, flat plains on the coasts. This lack of good arable land is why Japan has to import most of its food today and is a significant security challenge for them. Owen Swift is a geopolitics and defence analyst specialising in Australian and East Asian foreign policy. He's written for organisations such as the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and Monash University in Melbourne. Owen is also the senior producer and resident Asia-Pacific expert here at the Redline Podcast, and we are thrilled to finally have him join us on the show. Turning to natural resources, Japan just really lacks any of the significant strategic reserves that a state needs for security. They have little to no oil or coal or natural gas or iron, really pretty much any of the resources you can name that are important for high-end manufacturing or for generating power, likelihood is Japan doesn't have domestic access to it. Historically, when Japan was industrializing, it dealt with this problem with aggressive expansion into neighboring territories, capturing resources by invading the Korean Peninsula, parts of Imperial Russia, Manchuria, and Taiwan. Since losing World War II, it secured these resources through extensive trade networks and investments, particularly in Southeast Asia, which is why we see them playing such a hugely important role in that region. It's hard to understate just how devastating the Second World War was for Japan. Even before the Japanese entered the war with China for more territory, they occupied the Korean Peninsula, 
most of northeastern China, known as Manchukuo, Taiwan, and a vast Pacific Island Empire stretching from Kamchatka in the east of Russia to just north of modern-day West Papua. How much territory did Japan lose in the aftermath of the Second World War? Yeah, the end of World War II was absolutely devastating for Japan. Uh, it's the resources that it needed and the territory that it got those from were completely lost to it. And many of the islands that it held even before the war, it lost to the USSR or to the US. Many of the islands Japan lost at the end of the war were thousands of kilometers away from the home islands, but many of them were not. To go over the three biggest chains the Japanese lost, one of them would be Okinawa, which is now administered by the Americans and Japanese about 500 kilometers to the southwest of the southern tip of the Japanese home islands. To the north, though, at the end of the war, the Soviet Union occupied the islands of Sakhalin, 50 kilometers north of Hokkaido, and the Kuril Islands, that stretch all the way from the Kamchatka Peninsula in eastern Russia to just 18 kilometers at the closest point to the Japanese home islands. Japan had for a long time relied on these outer ring of defensive islands like Taiwan and Palau to make sure any sea or air battle would be kept far from the Japanese home front. But with the peace terms, Japan lost almost all of their outer layers. What impact do you think this had on Japanese defense planners? Okinawa and the Kuril Islands are really fundamental to Jap Japan's regional security. Uh, controlling those allows them to control the waterways around them for naval military movements and for trade. And having foreign powers control those meant that the, Japan no longer really had sovereignty over its own waters. Russia's control of the Kuril Islands is an example of how this layer of security for Japan has disappeared after that war. The Japanese fought some intense battles with the US in places like Iwo Jima and Okinawa towards the end of the war. So when the Japanese were finally occupied by the US after the war had finished, what was the mood in the Japanese population? Were they accepting of Americans being deployed on the Japanese home islands? Not everyone in Japan was happy with the US's presence uh, in their country. Advocacy groups and political groups to today can trace their origins to resisting or fighting against the amount of involvement the US had in the country. But we have to look at the political and geopolitical situation to understand why it was that Generally, the US was accepted. First, there was widespread starvation and economic ruin. The average person didn't really have time for political advocacy or protesting when they were struggling to even feed their families. The other thing to consider is the political situation. By the time Japan was defeated in World War II, Germany had been divided and under occupation for months, and Japanese newspapers would have been printing all the stories about the horrendous things the Germans suffered under Soviet occupation. Japan's leaders had to weigh up the prospect of a divided occupation between the Soviets and the US, which would split up the home islands, or a US-led occupation in which the occupiers seemed to be less brutal and the home islands would stay united. The latter would likely have been a much more appealing prospect for both the Japanese people and their leadership. The other factor to consider is that communist regimes around the world had been abolishing monarchies, and in Japan this would have meant the end of the imperial tradition. The US occupation offered to keep the emperor in place, but with a significantly reduced role. And in fact, during the US reconstruction, the emperor toured the country to encourage the average citizen to get involved and help the US efforts. After the war, the US, much like they did in Europe with the Marshall Plan, poured millions of dollars into the reconstruction of Japan, building up many of the areas and companies that were destroyed during the war. Can you take us through this reconstruction period? Revitalizing these companies was a key part of the massive investments that the US made into reconstructing Japan. They helped to get Japan back on its economic feet, and they continue to play a huge role today in both Japan's domestic economy and its foreign policy. The US also still sees the benefit of this investment, with many of these companies playing a significant role in the US economy, particularly in the auto market, with companies like Mitsubishi, Nissan, and Isuzu. As part of the peace terms Japan was forced to sign at the end of the war, they had to rewrite large parts of their constitution, including a clause for a defensive-only army. Can you take us through what was meant by this defensive-only clause? Yeah, so the post-war constitution that was written by the US included a section called Article 9, which forbids Japan from having an aggressive army or using force as a, as a dispute resolution measure. This meant that for decades, Japan's only military was a small defensive force that had no real capacity to project force overseas. 
which is why we saw policies in Japan like having a cap on military spending equal to 1% of the country's GDP. In recent years, though, this defensive-only posture has been stretched more and more, with things like Japan developing their amphibious capacities and performing naval operations with other states. It's also included developing aircraft carriers, which it instead calls helicopter-carrying destroyers, because Article 9 of their constitution doesn't allow Japan to possess carriers. During the 70s, 80s and 90s, Japan's economy exploded and they became a global financial powerhouse. There was even some thoughts they may even take over the US for the number one slot in GDP at one point. So what powered this rapid economic growth in a country that only decades beforehand had been nearly wiped out? There are a few key things that really enabled Japan's economy to explode in the way that it did. First is the economic liberalisation that took place under US occupation. This included land reforms, giving peasants and farmers control over their own land, breaking up and privatising the conglomerates that used to have a stranglehold on Japanese industry, and revolutionising education in Japan, which eventually gave them the world's highest rate of literacy. There's also the other side of the US relationship. The US economy and middle class was growing at this time, which meant that not only was there a lot of money heading towards Japan in the form of investments, but also the rapidly expanding American market was primed for Japanese exports of machinery, gadgets, and cars. Then we also have the government of Japan being able to focus all of its efforts on modernizing and rebuilding the economy because the guarantee of US protection freed them from the need to spend anything on rebuilding their military or securing their borders. Finally, we have to turn to the huge companies we discussed earlier that helped get Japan back on its feet. They developed a deeply competitive relationship with each other, which resulted in a lot of technological innovation and modernization in Japan's industrial and consumer sectors. They were also generously supported by the Japanese government through subsidies, tax breaks, and cheap loans, which helped them compete internationally. Even though we view Japan these days very differently, Tokyo has been at war with almost every one of its neighbors at some point in history. What are Japan's regional relationships like these days compared to previous times of war. Japan has good relations with most of its neighbors. Obviously, for defense purposes, it's heavily tied to the US with many bases in and around Japan. But it also has a good deal of trade with Taiwan, particularly in the high tech sectors, and is involved in investment and the development of many countries in Southeast Asia, particularly Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. In fact, it competes a lot with China in these states for contracts to build things like railway networks and telecommunications. It also has strong and developing relationships with India and Australia, which in recent years has involved more military cooperation. That said, of course, their biggest trading partner is China. It's not unusual in the region. A lot of states in the Asia Pacific are torn between America as their biggest defense partner and China as their biggest economic partner, which is what makes the US-China competition such a difficult conundrum in the Asia Pacific. But it's not just external enemies like Beijing that pose a problem for Tokyo. The internal demographics of Japan also pose a deep and serious problem for the country's long-term stability. Can you take us through this slow-moving crisis? One of the most severe problems that Japan faces is its massive demographic decline. Their population is rapidly aging, and they have one of the lowest birth rates in the developed world. This means that instead of having three to four workers paying into Social Security for each retired person, instead each worker has to support somewhere between two to four retired people. This puts a huge strain on the social security of the state and is one of the major reasons Japan has such massive amounts of debt. This problem isn't going away. In fact, it's only getting worse and there's no real easy answers for the Japanese government. Unless they can crack the secret of how to increase fertility rates in developed countries or they're able to maintain their economic productivity through some sort of robot or AI transformation, at some point to keep their economy afloat, Japan will be forced to undertake the deeply unpopular decision to massively increase immigration. Japan doesn't do much military projection these days, but it is still very involved in many of its regional neighbours in places like Vietnam, Indonesia and Australia. Uh, What is Japan's overall strategy when it comes to East and Southeast Asia in your opinion? Certainly Japan has focused on Southeast Asia and the South China Sea where they've been heavily involved for decades in developing ASEAN economies. You know, through the Japan Bank for International Cooperation and with their high tech industry, they've built up manufacturing, transportation and telecommunications in many of these countries. I mean, when we think about China's competition with the US in Southeast Asia, in many areas, we should really be talking about China's competition with Japan. 
Looking further afield, though, uh, it's key relationships in the Asia Pacific, uh, India and Australia. It's really deepened its relations with India in recent years, significantly increasing their trade and investments. Currently, they're working together to develop the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, as well as a number of high speed rail networks, most of which Japan is financing. Amongst all of these regional players that Japan works with, there is one big overarching problem, though, and this is known as the South China Sea. If, for example, war were to break out between China and Taiwan, do you think Japan would end up being sucked into the conflict by mere proximity to the area? If it really came down to it, Japan would have little choice but to be involved in a potential Taiwanese conflict because of how closely tied in it is to the US military apparatus. The United States would operate a good deal of their aerial operations out of places like Okinawa, and much of their Asian-focused naval forces are based out of ports in Japan and South Korea. That said, any conflict between Japan's key trade and key defence partner would be absolutely disastrous for them, and so they will do pretty much everything in their power to stop that kind of conflict from arising. During the rapid economic rise of Japan, former enemies of Tokyo in places like Seoul and Beijing worried what a titanic Japan would be capable of in the region. With China now being that ascendant power, how does Japan feel with the shoe on the other foot here? China's rise has been felt much more deeply by Japan than by almost anyone else. It's a difficult thing for them to grapple with domestically, raising questions about their constitution and remilitarization, which are politically very controversial topics. Balancing against China's rise is something that Japan's been working on for decades, which you can see through their economic competition throughout Asia and the fact that they've increased their defense budget for five years running. That said, of course, Japan has benefited a lot from China's growth. Its companies are heavily invested in China and it's a huge market for Japanese exports, which further deepens the rift between what is good for Japan's national security and what is good for their economy. Japan is stuck in the same boat as so many of the other nations in the Asian sphere. And much like South Korea, Australia, Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, they look to Washington for their defense guarantees, but look to Beijing for their money. Hoping beyond hope that the two sides never enter into full conflict, as they may have to make the decision about one or the other. The Japanese know better than most at how dire the situation is when the supply chain breaks down, and have been working on a solution to the problem now for over a century. But is it achievable without a vast empire and armed forces to back it up? Are you able to guarantee supply chains without aggression? Well, to answer that question, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. The Grand Dilemma Japan's post-war foreign policy doctrine was defined very much by the legacy of the Pacific War um, and the experience of defeat. And for the post-war generation and some of Japan's conservative leaders, most importantly, Prime Minister Yoshida Shigeru, who was Prime Minister in the 1940s and early 1950s, the idea of Japan as a as a, if you like, a postmodern state, a state that did not embrace the traditional ingredients of power. Uh, a standing army, a belief in the use of force overseas to promote its national interests, and of course, allied to that, a strong commitment to Article 9 of the Japanese constitution, the so-called peace clause. Japan focused for most of the post-war period on building up its economy, on relying on the United States for its security guarantees, both the nuclear umbrella of extended deterrence, but also the practical security cooperation that came out of the US-Japan Security Alliance. But at the same time, because of internal tensions between conservatives and progressives, there was always a push by conservative politicians to find a way for Japan, if you like, through the back door to develop its own de facto military, the so-called self-defense forces. But those self-defense forces, as the name suggests, were there to purely protect Japan from a hostile attack from outside. There was no notion that Japan would be able to deploy its forces overseas either with the United States or with other countries. John Nilsson Wright is a senior lecturer on Japanese politics and international relations for Cambridge University, a senior research fellow for Northeast Asia for Chatham House, as well as the author of the amazing book Unequal Allies, all about the post-war relationship between Japan and the United States. 
It's fantastic to have John join us today. And what's important, I think, to recognize now is that gradually, incrementally, that taboo against involvement in foreign security uh, operations has been steadily eroded because those conservatives have wanted, in a sense, to reacquire a more formal type of great power status. And Mr. Abe, of course, Prime Minister from 2012 to 2020, was at the forefront of that push. Um, and we saw that in 2015 with new security legislation that allowed Japan to participate in so-called collective security operations, not just with the United States, but with allies in the region. It's one reason, I think, why Japan is now embracing the Quad as a way of acting in concert with other powers. So that, that allergy about being involved in conventional great power politics has gradually become less of a constraint on Japan because of those governing elites, particularly those conservative politicians who've wanted to see Japan become more proactive. The problem for Japan uh, is that Japanese public opinion hasn't moved in the same direction. So there is an inherent tension between that old notion of the Yoshida doctrine, Japan as a non-military power focusing on economic development, and Japan as a more conventional power, a strategic player with a strategic vision and a willingness to use military force, not just to defend its own territory, but also to, to support the um, international rules-based order. And that's become a hallmark of the new approach that Japan has been developing really for the past eight or nine years. To begin this conversation, I want to ask you how far you think the Japanese military influence extends these days. Is it just the home islands? Is it into the South China Sea? Is it up to the Strait of Malacca or even beyond that? How powerful is the Japanese military in this area of the world? It, it, it's a little hard to say because the Japanese government, I think conscious of those domestic constraints, domestic um, ambivalence, also very aware that the legacy of World War II has meant that Japan's neighbors in the region and further afield, but particularly China, obviously, um, uh, but also even nominal de facto allies like South Korea are very nervous about the idea of Japan being more, um, more engaged. Uh, and so the Japanese government has pursued a policy, implicit policy of, of, if you like, strategic ambiguity. And the clearest expression of that is the is the Indo-Pacific strategy first articulated by then Prime Minister Abe back in 2013. That Indo-Pacific strategy has been revised from a strategy to a vision and now simply to a concept. Um, precisely, I think, because, because of those concerns about domestic wariness and foreign wariness, also because there is no general consensus about what the Indo-Pacific concept should look like, um, not just on the part of Japan, but other countries. The United States, for example, under Donald Trump, had a much more conventional notion of the Indo-Pacific strategy. But Japan has, in a sense, decided to use both its economic clout, its aid diplomacy, all of these, are, these are all core components of its Indo-Pacific concept, um, as well as its military um, force and might to, to try and ensure the security of this very extensive geopolitical space that stretches, as you rightly point out, from East Africa all the way to, uh, to Japan itself. In that context, I think it's the near abroad which matters to Japan. Um, and by that, I mean the territories surrounding the Senkaku Islands, just off Okinawa, um, the, the question of security in the East China Sea. That's where we're most likely to see cooperative security partnerships. But of course, through the Quad, we also see a more active willingness to contemplate security operations in the South China Sea. Um, not so much the deployment of conventional military force, but joint exercises, support for freedom of navigation operations on the part of other more conventional actors, particularly the United States. Um, but the, the reason why the Japanese government can't simply say, we will deploy where necessary, um, with impunity, if you like, with, with a willingness to take military action where security interests are at risk, is because the constitutional constraints that define when military action is permissible are very tightly circumscribed. It's only in situations where the national integrity of Japan is threatened that the Japanese government can confidently expect to deploy force, either by itself or in concert with other powers. 
Um, what's happened in the last five years is that the definition of the national interest and national integrity has been stretched to go beyond a simple geographical concept, namely the territory of Japan, the four principal islands of Japan, to a concept that embodies the security of its own people, whether at home or abroad. So Japanese businessmen, Japanese tourists, any, any Japanese abroad, if they're threatened, the Japanese state and its military resources could be deployed to protect them, or access to critical raw materials. Um, so protecting the sea lanes of communication is permissible if failure to do so would, would negatively affect the national integrity of Japan. So if you can imagine, for example, a conflict in the Gulf where oil supplies were being compromised, then it might be permissible to imagine Japan using the maritime self-defense forces to guarantee the integrity of those critical supply lines. But that's very much an untested hypothetical situation. And bear in mind, precious few, if any, Japanese troops have been killed in action. Um, so there is no precedent for Japanese forces being involved in conflicts that we would recognize as conventional conflicts. And any, any wary, sensible, cautious Japanese politician, knowing that public opinion at home um, might resist any such deployment, wants to avoid getting drawn into those sorts of engagements. It's one reason why, for example, the status of Taiwan is so important. And we saw that in the recent Biden Suga summit, summit with a, a statement pushed by the Americans, which the Japanese cautiously agreed to, to um, underline the importance of the peace and security of the Taiwan Straits and of Taiwan itself. Any notion that Japan would become involved in a conflict over Taiwan raises all of these concerns, and that wariness would become, I think, once again, part of any debate in Japan about the appropriateness of taking military action. But there has been a slow but steady incremental change in the willingness of Japanese politicians to begin to talk about these issues. That's not just because of the security imperatives of dealing with a rising China, um, but also, I think, a recognition that in the Biden era with the United States pushing so hard for Japan and other allies to be more explicitly engaged in mutual military deterrent action, whether that's conventional or unconventional, um, there is more pressure on Japan to be seen to be doing more, uh, particularly uh, on critical issues where there is a, a sense of real vulnerability. And Taiwan is probably the most dramatic illustration of that. The perceived threat, though, is not just from across the East China Sea. With Russia's occupation of the Kuril and Sakhalin Islands just off the north coast of Japan, Russian planes are now in a position to be in Japanese airspace within two to three minutes. Does Japan ever have any hope of removing Russia from these islands and regaining control, taking away this dagger they feel is pointed at them? I think the Northern Territories, the two Southern Kuril Islands that you mentioned, Etorofu and Kunishiri, and... Um, the smaller islands south of them, Shikotan and the Habamais, um, there's no doubt that um, on the part of some Japanese conservative politicians, Mr. Abe most strikingly of all, um, there is a sense that this is an unresolved issue, a hangover from the, the final stages of World War II, and of course the Russians um, in the final closing days occupied those islands. So for those conservatives like Mr. Abe, um, pragmatic nationalists, they certainly believe that they have a legitimate claim and they see it as a, a way of resolving what is often described as the long post-war, bringing this to an end by gaining those territories. Um, however, they are realists and they recognise that they're, you know, despite all of their efforts, and Mr Abe was unstinting in trying to move the needle in negotiations with Putin, um, the chance of a, of a breakthrough is, is vanishingly small, I would say. The Japanese recognize that negotiations with Putin have not been successful. Um, hopes are periodically raised by the willingness of Moscow to talk about a possible two-island solution under which potentially, for example, Japan might reclaim the two smaller southernmost islands, the Habamais and Shikotan, in return for a, a significant amount of economic assistance. Um, so there is, if you like, the potential of a deal but politics, and also let's not forget strategy, sometimes intervene, most importantly, the strategic interest for the Russians of having an ice-free point of access from the Sea of Okhotsk into the Pacific. Um, this is really important for the Russians, and 
um, having that strategic platform via the Kurals and the Southern Islands has meant that Russian strategic thinkers are loath to give up um, territorial gains. And of course, just the very concept of any sort of territorial concession, because it might open Russia to other revisionist claims um, from other countries, uh, makes Moscow typically reluctant to go down that route. Um, I don't think the interest on the part of Japan is going to um, disappear when it comes to finding a solution to this issue, because the the emotional significance of regaining territory, as was the case with Okinawa back in the late 1960s in negotiations with the Americans, remains really strong. And I would argue it's probably gotten stronger uh, in the post-Cold War era as it has become more legitimate, at least for conservative Japanese politicians, to embrace a type of identity politics grounded in a sense of a confident, secure Japan, which is able to reclaim some of its uh, natural territory. Um, beyond this, I mean, obviously Japan de facto, you know, maintains its presence in the Sengaku Islands, which is uh, territory, of course, contested with China. Um, it retains its ambitions to um, reacquire Takashima, which the Koreans, the South Koreans, of course, know as Tokto, which is possessed by the Koreans. Um, I don't think there's any real significant view in Tokyo that this is something that could be, um, this is a goal that could be realized, but the political salience of this issue means that no national leader in Japan could give up its claim for Takashima. Um, and of course, there are local politics Shimane Prefecture itself, closest to Takashima, um, continues to stress the importance of regaining this territory. So it will continue to be a live issue in terms of politics at home in Japan, and also importantly in bilateral, bilateral relations with Seoul, uh, which, as you know, have been poisoned recently by continuing disputes over history, as well as these contentious territorial claims. One of those frankly contentious relationships is that one between Seoul and Tokyo. You would think with both of them being developed economies with similar allies and enemies, they would probably be far closer. So why is there this tension between the two nations of Japan and South Korea? The Seoul-Tokyo relationship is puzzling, isn't it? Because rationally, when you look at this, these are two vibrant liberal democracies, two critical allies of the United States, um, and allies that have been in that role in the case of Japan since 1951, in the case of Korea since 1953, um, given where they sit, their strategic importance is huge. Given the common set of problems that both Tokyo and Seoul confront in the form of North Korea and the wider challenge of China, you would think there are powerful economic, strategic and political reasons for these two countries to be closely allied and to work in concert. But the problem of history keeps getting in the way. Uh, and underlining that is a palpable sense of emotional dissonance between the populations and leaders of both countries. Uh, the Koreans feel that the basis for reconciliation between Seoul and Tokyo in the post-war period, um, the 1965 Joint Normalization Treaty, a normalization treaty that was signed by the then authoritarian government of Park Chung-hee, um, uh, and the administration of Sato Eisaku in Japan, um, that agreement was, in a sense, compromised precisely because it was an agreement reached by a dictator rather than a democratic regime in the case of South Korea. And much of the economic terms of that agreement, um, in the form of $80 billion worth of Japanese assistance to South Korea, um, did not go to the victims of the colonial period. Uh, it went to provide the support for the miracle on the Han River, South Korea's own experiment in economic modernization. Uh, it was undoubtedly hugely important for South Korea um, as it grew economically and became a more secure country. Um, but the fact that ordinary Koreans didn't see the, the direct fruits of that compensation um, has meant that for progressive politicians like the current president, President Moon and others, there is a sense of unresolved business associated with um, the pre-war colonial period and also these, these hangovers from uh, the Cold War, post-war period. On top of this, we've had most recently um, a decision by the Suga administration to release contaminated radioactive water from the Fukushima radioact 
uh, nuclear power plant. Um, this has been seen as a red rag to a bull in South Korea. South Korean fishermen, uh, the governor of Jeju uh, province, the island uh, closest to Japan in terms of uh, exposure to the, this contaminated uh, water, have seen this as further evidence that Japan doesn't care about the interests of South Koreans and that Japan is willing to uh, to dismiss legitimate South Korean concerns. Uh, and on top of that, of course, um, you know, the issue of Japan and the sense of grievance from the colonial period is probably the one single most powerful issue that can unite both conservatives and progressives in South Korea. Um, it's the one issue they can all agree on. Japan is a convenient target uh, for criticism. Um, we've seen that even over something that should ideally be bringing the two countries to closer together, which is the Olympics. You know, sport should be an opportunity for cooperation. But there have been disputes over the iconography associated with the Olympics, the willingness of the Japanese government to use images that to Koreans seem to be a direct reminder of the colonial period. The traditional um, flag that Japan used in the pre-war period um, is being cited as um, a deliberate provocation um, by, uh, by voters and politicians in South Korea. So there are a lot of these sorts of issues that complicate relationship between the two countries, on top of which there are practical tensions associated with North Korea. Um, there is a type of strategic asymmetry between Tokyo um, and Seoul when it comes to dealing with North Korea. Both countries are on the same page when it, when it comes to dealing with the challenge of a nuclear North Korea. But for the Japanese, for example, uh, the threat from North Korea's ballistic missiles, short, medium or long range, as well as the issue of so-called abductees, those Japanese citizens who were forcibly removed from Japan by North Korean agents in the 1970s and 80s. This is a lingering sore. It hasn't been resolved. It's a big political impediment to improve dialogue between Tokyo and Pyongyang. That's not something that really matters very much, if at all, to ordinary Koreans. So there are these practical questions as well as the, the kind of lingering, painful historical and cultural issues that I mentioned earlier. With the Japanese being so dependent on foreign goods, even just to feed the population, and with the supply chain being so thin, do you think it forces Tokyo into staying out of packs to defend partners in the region like Taiwan? Does Tokyo fear that in the event of a war over Taiwan, that entering it would cut their supply chains and cause them huge damage on the home islands? The, the issue of supply chains, I think, is, is a relevant one. Um, and I, I suspect it would be difficult, but I don't think it's necessarily the primary impediment for Japanese involvement in such a conflict. Far more, I think, powerful as a disincentive for getting involved um, are, are three things. One, the Japanese state concern about how Japanese public opinion would react. Um, and I think it's probably arguable that the Japanese public would be reluctant to get involved, even though you know, there's growing sense of wariness about China, deep distrust of China on the part of the Japanese public. Taiwan doesn't seem like their game. It doesn't seem like an issue that matters to ordinary Japanese citizens. So I think the state would be reluctant to get involved. The second constraint is the fear of escalation. You know, a conflict over Taiwan, could it be contained? Would it spread into a larger conflagration and would Japan be sucked into this? Um, that's a huge concern. Um, but offsetting that is the perception and the growing recognition in Tokyo that Japan has little choice because the Americans now are increasingly pushing them to take a tougher position on Taiwan. Kurt Campbell, the new Indo-Pacific coordinator under President Biden, shortly before Suga's visit to Washington was in Tokyo and was seeking to get a commitment from the Japanese government to something equivalent to the Taiwan Relations Act, um, the, the act that governs America's relations with Taiwan, to, if you like, persuade Tokyo to make political and security-based commitments to Taiwan that would be unambiguous. The Suga administration, I think, wisely, from their point of view, avoided agreeing to that. Um, but they know that if they're, if they're going to keep the alliance secure and solid and reliable, they need to show a greater willingness to, to make the right noises about supporting Taiwan. It's one reason why we've seen ambitious, prominent politicians like former Foreign Minister Kishida, for example, 
uh, who's jockeying for the succession once Mr. Suga retires, coming out with their own surprising public statement saying, in the event of a conflict over Taiwan, yes, Japanese um, maritime self-defense forces could be deployed. I think they're to provide logistical support. I don't think we're going to see Japanese um, naval vessels deployed with any notion of of actually participating in military action. Um, but the pressure to be seen to support the United States in the event of a conflict with China is is pretty irresistible. Um, but obviously what Tokyo wants and also what Washington wants is to rely on deterrence so that we never actually get to that situation where a conflict is likely to take place. Um, that's why the Quad matters. That's why um, the very muscular language that Secretary of State Blinken and uh, Defense Secretary Austin used in the recent 2 plus 2 meetings in Tokyo um, was so important in underscoring the, the salience of deterrence, um, of extended deterrence. Uh, we saw that, of course, in the 2 plus 2 meetings in Seoul and also the summit meeting between President Moon and President Blinken, uh, President Biden, excuse me. Um, so this is, uh, this is a growing convergence of um, strategic awareness on the part of the United States and its key allies on the importance of deterring China. Uh, and that also reflects the changing balance of material capabilities. China's increase in its conventional and nuclear capabilities means that the United States recognizes that its ability to fight an effective military campaign in the Pacific is now increasingly being compromised by the acceleration in China's own military buildup. It's one reason why we've had discussions about the potential deployment of strategic missiles on uh, the island chains that connect Japan with other um, allies in the region. And therefore, I think we're going to see more focus on declaratory policy, a greater willingness, cautious on the part of Japanese, to, to sign up to those declarations. But they're all intended to avoid and minimize the risk of an actual military escalation. The old adage, you know, if you want peace, prepare for war, still remains, I think, an important part of the calculations of the different regional actors. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. It's a very old saying, and it's applied all throughout history with the Americans and the Soviets in World War II, the Kurds and the Iranians fighting ISIS, and the British and French going against the Germans in the First World War. It goes without saying that if your nation is worried about the expansion of one of your neighbours, one of the best things you can do is seek out someone bigger to be on your side, to readjust the balance in your favour. In the case of Japan, they've had the North Koreans, the Russians and the Chinese on their doorstep for centuries now, having gone to war with all three of them at some point in history. And although Japan has historically punished way above its weight in events like the Battle of Tsushima in the Russo-Japanese War, the Japanese military on its own is now no match for the sheer size of Beijing's might. And I think Tokyo knows that. The solution to this, though, could be a regional alliance of nations. An alliance of nations also fearful of an unchecked Beijing. And one of the best hopes for an alliance like that would be the one known today as the Quad, a strategic partnership between Japan, the United States, Australia, and India. But how coordinated is the Quad? And would one come to defend another in the event of war? Is the Quad as big as it's ever going to be? Or will it expand to become the new Asian NATO? Well, to answer all those questions, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. A United Front? Uh, look, I think Japan um, strategically is evolving its its um, defence posture and national security posture, and re-examining things like uh, supply chains um, and strategic depth. I think that uh, this has been coming for some time. So the early indicators of this are projects like Impex, where you're seeing um, energy um, resilience being built and depth in that energy supply. On the other side, what we see is you know that, that announcement last week. Uh, and not just a discussion, you know, it's really quite clear, uh, historically, um, driven by uh, by the security situation, Japan is really considering um, and beginning that conversation about moving above the long-held 1% cap of, 1% uh, of GDP cap on spending. So 
I think we're seeing a, a, a Japan that is evolving, that is very clearly has an understanding of the threat that it, um, it is um, dealing with right now and may deal with into the future and is, um, is preparing for that at a great speed. John Coyne is the head of the North Australia policy, as well as the head of strategic policing and law enforcement for the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, known as ASPE. John is one of Australia and the US's most trusted experts when it comes to the dynamics of East Asia. And we are thrilled to have him join us on the show again today. You know, if you're asking me, John, will we see an overnight change or a short term change away from the US? No, I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that Japanese interests and US interests are very similar at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of concern over Taiwan, a lot of concern over the assertive behaviour of the um, Chinese um, Communist Party and the People's Liberation Army uh, in the South China Sea. Um, the activities of the air forces, uh, air forces across EEZs, etc. So, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see that great parting of ways. Um, I think, though, that what we will see is the Japanese making other partnerships. And this is what we've certainly started to see in terms of the relationship between Australia and Japan. A major part of this conversation will revolve around the Quad Agreement, a strategic partnership between the nations of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. Can you take us through what exactly is the Quad? Look, I don't think it, it is most definitely not the new NATO. And I think people need to, um, you know, you and I have spoken about this in the past. We've talked about it, you know, we've talked about it in the sense of ASEAN. So, and I use that as an example, it's a perfect one because it's the same sort of thing. So everyone looks at ASEAN and says, you know, ASEAN is no EU. Um, the problem, of course, is, is ASEAN doesn't aspire to be e the EU. Okay, so in a similar way, the Quad is not NATO. And I would suggest that it never will be. Um, but at the same time, it sends a very powerful message to the Chinese Communist Party of the possibility of that cooperation, um, at the very least. So I think it's a, it's a very powerful tool for improving dialogue, uh, and certainly three of the four partners are very much committed to that um, in terms of the dialogue and agreements, so uh, Japan, the US and ourselves. Um, I think that... I think that the um, Quad can be used to address a range of different um, challenges in the region, um, not the least of which are things like uh, possibly counter-terrorism, um, also looking at um, things like freedom of navigation exercises. And, you know, so I do see that there's opportunities to do a range of activities, dealing with um, rare earth elements and critical minerals and creating alternative supply chains to reduce the reliance on China. Um, or the China, on the Chinese manufacturing and industry and um, rare earth elements. So, you know, I can see some cooperation around those specific areas, um, but it is most definitely not a military pact like NATO. How deep is coordination with the Quad Forces here? For example, could Australia focus on submarines while the US forces focus on surface ships? How invested are the Quad Forces in each other's nations? Yeah, look, Michael, not at all. You know, I think this is one of those things. I think that, um, you know, interestingly, we, we saw Australia participate in the Malabar exercise last year, which is really, really important, a major step forward. Um, this thing is evolutionary. So, you know, while, um, while some panda huggers or, um, uh, you know, will sit there and look at this, uh, <clears throat> and, and certainly Beijing will as well with great concern, this at the moment is nowhere near that. It's something evolutionary uh, at the beginning of its evolution. And certainly, you know, we had some false starts um, and we're seeing, um, seeing some real progress. But I think also, you know, we're seeing far quicker progress in the relationship between um, the trilateral relationship between Japan, the US and Australia. Well, that raises a very interesting question. India is part of the Quad, but they do much less in the way of joint operations compared to the other three, that being Japan, the United States, and Australia. Does India's participation in the Quad extend outside the Indian Ocean, or is it simply a convenient, the enemy of the enemy is my friend kind of arrangement here? Look, I think for them, they're worried about the Indian Ocean. I, I think I made, I made the comment earlier to you with India, you know, um, 
the, before we get on to domestic terrorism problems in India, uh, economic challenges, um, you know, just just in terms of national threats uh, on both borders or on two of their borders, they've got major problems um, dealing with their relationship um, with Pakistan um, and the potentiality for that to go nuclear. Um, and on the other border, dealing with um, land battles already, and admittedly very primitive ones right now, um, with the Chinese uh, Communist Party, uh, these, you know, they've got enough, enough to worry about. And the challenge would be what value do they get from that? Now, the other issue is, is you know, once the Belt and Road Initiative, um, as it continues along, uh, and the Chinese Communist Party's um, military forces, so the PLA, have access to ports in, say, Pakistan, um, that will change the equation too. So there'll be a greater focus on the uh, on the Indian Ocean, but certainly I don't see their focus suddenly becoming shared across the whole of the Indo-Pacific. Um, that's not to preclude joint exercises, nor is to preclude um, port visits, but it's just like their primary focus is not going to change the South China Sea. Why limit it to the Quad? There are lots of other nations in this region like South Korea, Thailand and New Zealand that have very similar foreign policy goals here. Why not expand it to include these very like-minded nations? There's some issues here around um, shared um, understandings of the threat environment. Um, and I think, you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to get lost. And we, we've seen this with the progress of NATO, where you rapidly expand um, and the challenges that go along with that. Um, so, you know, I think they were a wise step to bring those four together. Uh, it's not to preclude the membership of others. And, you know, um, you know, look, let's be controversial. You know, even the traditional Five Eyes, uh, if we look at some of the issues with um, some of the commentary and policy decisions of, um, of uh, the New Zealand government over recent years, one could quickly assume that perhaps, you know, Japan, if the Five Eyes was going to remain in the Five Eyes, that perhaps Japan would be a better partner in the Five Eyes. So why did India join this pact in the first place? They've always been traditionally not aligned in most of these movements, and they still get the majority of their weapons from Moscow. So what made them jump in bed with Tokyo and Washington on this one? There's a genuine concern about the assertive behaviour and um, the scale of the threat potentially posed by the People's Liberation Army and the aspirations of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, you know, we've had some false starts with this, like I said, so it's not like it's been a clear path to this. Um, and certainly, um, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, the Indian government has been slow to move forward in terms of the quad. Um, it's picking up that pace now, um, but, you know, it, it's being very, very careful about how it engages on the issue of quad. The false star there being the fact that the Quad originally actually started in 2007, but was disbanded in 2008 after large Chinese pressure on the Quad nations. The Quad, though, was restarted in 2017 after Chinese expansion in the region. Now, you said the Quad is in no way a NATO equivalent, but is there something in it like an Article 5? If China was to, let's say, invade India, would Japan, Australia, or the US come to their aid? You know what? I, uh, it, it's a tough one to say. I mean, I, I, if you're asking me under the current arrangements, and you know, almost certain, um, you know, that, that's a big assessment. Um, would would we would we sacrifice blood and treasure, um, and would the Americans and Japanese um, sacrifice blood and treasure in India? Uh, I think it all depends on the context. But in a general sense, I don't. I can't see that occurring. In 1949, the US formed NATO to counter the Soviet bloc in Europe. Moscow then responded in 1955 with the Warsaw Pact, a kind of NATO arrangement made up of Soviet-aligned nations. If the US is building up the Quad now, do you think China will move to make their own version to counter the US? And if so, what nations do you think would join the Chinese version of the Quad? Uh, look, I don't think so. Uh, I don't, you know, and if they did, it certainly wouldn't have the same commitment. One of the primary military goals of the Quad Nations was a sort of containment strategy against the Chinese Navy, to form a line between Japan, Okinawa, Taiwan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam and Malaysia in an attempt to keep them 
boxed into the South China Sea. Do you think this is actually at all possible with the strength of the Chinese Navy at the moment? Uh, look, I don't think they can. I think this is, I think the horse has bolted on that one. Um, you know, they have a global fishing fleet that is moving all over the, over the globe in the ocean. I don't think that um, the Belt and Road Initiative will provide new ports. Um, you know, we see, you know, a Chinese military facility in, in Djibouti. Um, I don't think there was ever a possibility of containing them. So, for instance, in the 90s, the assessment over uh, China's plans to retake Taiwan, you know, people said they didn't have a blue water navy. Um, and, you know, we find ourselves, so, you know, we find ourselves, you know, two decades later, three decades later, and they have a, a splendid blue water navy augmented by a, a maritime militia, augmented by a global fishing fleet, augmented by um, lily pad islands or, um, you know, fixed facilities that are aircraft, essentially aircraft carriers in the um, South China Sea. So, um yeah, look, I'm not sure that we ever were going to or could, and I, certainly that, I've never had that discussion about containment of China in that way. What about base sharing? Could the Quad expand to, let's say, allow joint bases between these four nations in places like Darwin in Australia or Okinawa in Japan? Look, I think there's a couple of options for this, So, and I've written on these. So, um, in short, I think, yes, there can be. So I, I believe that... Um, that at least trilaterally, but if not with the quad, um, with varying degrees, if, if you look at it, the port of Darwin or the har harbour of Darwin is, a, uh, is, you know, it's in the middle of the Indo-Pacific, literally. And it provides, it could become a joint naval facility or a joint logistics facility for all of the members of the quad. Uh, probably less so um, for India, but most definitely for Japan um, and the US. Uh, the US has already made it clear, the US Marines have made it clear, we have some of the best um, training um, facilities in the world in Northern Australia, um, whether it be for, and, and able to truly exercise fifth generation warfare capabilities in places like Delamere Range. Um, you know, being able to shake out um, formation levels, um, armoured level exercises and um, so, you know what, I, I, I do see that. We're already seeing that. The Osmin announcement last year that the um, the US government was going to invest some $200 million US into building um, its own fuel supplies uh, in um, storage in Darwin is an important step forward with that. But I think we can do more. Um, so, yeah, look, I do, I do think that that's a case where we could possibly see that sort of facility and joint training facilities. Um, there are sensitivities, and those sensitivities aren't just in Australia, those sensitivities are in the US, they're in the, um, and in Japan for that matter. Um, but I don't see they're insurmountable. And I also think there's an opportunity, which I wrote about recently, which is um, uh, with a friend and colleague, John Powers, and I said, you know, there, there is also a possibility um, with the increasing conduct of um, HADR operations, so humanitarian assistance and disaster response, operations in the region. Um, I do wonder if we could have a, um, a a joint headquarters of some description to better coordinate that, those sorts of HADR activities and patrolling activities and, um, you know, to build and test the sorts of command and control arrangements that are needed to work more closely together. All four of these coordinations are still highly dependent on China financially, and they are at risk of China hitting back at them economically. How far do you think we can push the Quad before we see China strike back on a financial front? Well, look, I think they're already responding with economic blowback. I mean, um, you know, if we list out and you're in WA, you know, you it's certainly a part of Australia that has been hit hard by, um, by unofficial sanctions um, and trade disputes, etc. So I think we're already being punished. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, and there's already a challenge for that. You know, nary a day goes by where um, our major newspapers don't carry a story about the private sector or someone from the private sector, you know, an industry saying, you know, we need to fix this thing. Um, you know, it, it, China has already given us a list of, um, a 14 point list of um, ultimatums. Um, you know, uh, as recently as the last couple of days, the Chinese Communist Party has said that, you know, should we intervene 
and bearing in mind we're not threatening to intervene, um, should we intervene in um, and, and defend Taiwan, um, that the first missiles will be sent our way. I think there's some really shocking things. So I, I'm not sure you are right. It's very difficult to unpick. Um, but certainly it, it's, um, you know, the, um, certainly the Chinese Communist Party are already punishing us for that. With Japan having spent the last few decades only focusing on self-defence, do you think this move into the Quad signifies a new, more aggressive doctrine for Tokyo? Not at all. I don't think so. I think that, you know, uh, I, I can assure you, um, you know, uh, both um, the Diet um, individual ministers and the general Japanese public um, are very aware and are not looking at a return to some sort of assertive, um, aggressive uh, approach to international relations, um, nor their military activities. Um, you know, I think there's a great deal of fear about that. Um, and indeed, you know, even basing and exercising and operating offshore, you know, uh, incredibly sensitive for the general population. Um, so look, I don't, I don't think that we're going to see that sort of major change. What we're going to see is a, a far more prepared, and I think far more prepared um, Japan militarily. I think what we're going to see is some really strong, um, and we saw that with rare earths where um, where the Japanese were punished economically with access to rare earths and sought to um, disrupt the monopoly uh, of the, the, the Chinese um, Communist Party has enjoyed over the supply of rare earth elements to, and successful to some extent. So I think, you know, projects like Impex and others like that will become more common. Um, that give strategic depth and energy resilience and economic resilience to Japan. What do you see in the future for the Quad? Do you think it will be more or less integration, or will it fall apart much like it did in 2008? Uh, look, I don't think it's going to fall apart, Michael. I think that it's going to be around for some time to come. I think it'll be... Um, I think it'll have a, a deep symbolic um, value. I can see it having success on... You know, maybe two or three things where that you know there's like very maybe humanitarian and disaster resilience we see greater cooperation there. Um, so I think in some areas we'll see some successes like that. Um, but realistically, I don't see it. You know, it, it neither aspires to become a NATO-like structure or an EU-like structure or anything like that. And I think that's unlikely to be the case um, ever. Um, I do think that we'll see a greater, uh, between the US, Japan, and Australia, a greater level of cooperation. As much as a lot has changed in this region, I think looking past the surface, a lot has stayed the same. Japan's goals in the Russo-Japanese War, World War I and World War II were never just glory to the emperor. The goals were to create a steady and stable supply chain to feed the Japanese people. A way to make up for the unfortunate lack of natural resources located on the Japanese home islands. To know that no enemy could blockade and cripple Tokyo in the event of a war. Because as anyone knows, no matter how good a fighter you are, you will never be able to be at your best when you're starving. Japan is trying to solve this fundamental problem in two ways building up good relationships with partners who can supply things like steel from Australia, oil from Malaysia, and rubber from Thailand, with the added bonus of knowing that a job created in these countries is a job not located in their regional adversary, China. The second plan is to make military partnerships with like-minded nations like the United States, Australia, South Korea, and Taiwan, all of whom fear an expansionist Beijing. This coordination is still at the early stages, though, as all of these nations listed have one fundamental problem. That problem is that China, in most cases, is still their largest trading partner, and in the event of a war, they would have to make a terrible fundamental decision to either side with the US and take a huge economic hit, or side with China and risk US blockades and repercussions. Becoming less reliant on China, though, is much easier said than done, especially when your economy is staring over the edge at a demographic crisis in the form of an aging and retiring population, a low birth rate, and an adversity to immigration for low-skilled workers to fill the tax pool. Stacking all of that up though, this is Japan. 
The nation to survive the Mongols. The first non-European nation to smash the Russian Navy. The nation to suffer one of the worst bombing campaigns of all time, and yet still become the third largest economy in the world within a few decades. Japan is a country that has time and time again come up against overwhelming fundamental challenges and has conquered them all. If there were a nation to be able to possibly solve this huge regional question, it might just be Japan. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned in this month. By the math, this episode should be the one to put us over the 2 million streams mark. It took 442 days to get to a million streams. And by the math, it will have only taken us 187 to get to the second million. And all of this is thanks to you telling your friends and family and tuning into the show each and every fortnight. So from the entire team here at The Red Line, I want to say thank you for helping us to boost this program. To celebrate this, we're having our second Geopolitics pub quiz next weekend after the success of the first one. This will be a live event held over Zoom, hosted by me going through curly geopolitical questions from around the globe, as well as having a few laughs. It was great fun last time, and I can't think of a better way to celebrate the upcoming 2 million streams mark than with you guys over some geopolitics trivia. So I look forward to seeing you guys next week. If you want to get more of the details on this, you can follow the show to get all these details for the pump quiz, as well as read new articles and analysis. You can find all of that on our social media. We're located on the handle at the Red Line Pod on Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, Discord, Instagram, and Swell. Or if you want to find me personally, I'm on Twitter on the handle at Mike Hilliard Oz. Oz is in Australia. This show would not be possible without the support of our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep this show going. Our Patreons get to join in on games nights and live Q&As, and also get extra materials from the show. Our Patreon's donations go 100% back into the program and help us pay for staff, program, hosting, website, and lawyers that are essential for running a show like this. And I cannot thank our current Patreons nearly enough for their support of the show. So if you feel that you can spare a few dollars a week, we would greatly appreciate it. As always, here are our three recommended reads for this week if you want to take the study into this subject even deeper. The first would be Asia's Cauldron by friend of the show Robert D. Kaplan going through the complexities of the Asian region. The second would be Japan's New Regional Reality, Geoeconomic Strategy in the Asia-Pacific, by Suri N. Katata. And the third would be The Rising Sun, by John Toland, for some historical context around Japan's rise and fall. I also want to thank our guests this week, Owen Swift, John Nilsson Wright, and John Coyne. All of you were absolutely fantastic, and we were very lucky to have you on the show. We will be sure to invite all of you back on very soon. I need to also thank my staff, Owen Swift, the producer and guest for this episode, Perry Grace and Daniela Zavella, research assistants and writers here at the show, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. Without you guys, this show would not be possible at all. So I want to say thank you for all of your hard work. I couldn't do this without you. The last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. There is no way we would be anywhere near where we are without all of your support of this program. So thank you. The show will be back in a fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.